On Tech News Today, Reddit CEO Ellen Pao apologizes. Plus, Japan and America are set to fight in the epic robot battle of the decade. And has Apple's control freakery finally gone too far? It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, July 7th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is After Nine's content czar, Joe Panitari. Hey, Joe Panitari, what's going on, man? Uh, quite a bit. We're very, very busy with software development. Now, what we're actually developing is a whole other story, but life is good. How are things by you? Things are good. Uh, we got some really interesting news today, and uh, we're going to be talking about some of the biggest uh, issues in technology today. For example, is Apple a total control freak? We'll get right into that uh, story in a few minutes, but first let's get to uh, a another big story that uh, just about everybody online is talking about, which is, of course, Reddit. In the wake of a mod revolt on Reddit over the sacking of popular AMA coordinator Victoria Taylor, Reddit CEO Ellen Powell acknowledged that the company screwed up and she promised to try harder. Joining us to talk about all this is TechCrunch writer Sarah Burr, Mother Jones reporter Josh Harkinson, and Newsweek reporter Polly Mossens. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Now, Sarah, Thanks. let's start with you. Ellen Powell admitted that she or they, Reddit, screwed up. So what is her understanding about what they did wrong? So, well, that depends on who you ask, right? So if you ask uh, Reddit or if you look at the apology, uh, it looks like uh, they admitted that they didn't listen to the community uh, on a number of issues. And the apology included things that they would do to rectify the situation. Uh, they included that they would add new tools for moderators, that they would... Uh, set two different kind, uh, moderators, developers in place to help with moderators. Um, there, there are a number of things that they, that they have promised. But if you ask the community, depending on who you ask, some part of the community looks like they're, they're happy that uh, there was finally an acknowledgement that there was something wrong and that they apologize. The rest of them, it, it, a lot of Redditors don't seem to believe that this is actually going to fix anything. They're still upset about uh, the dismissal of Victoria Taylor, who was in charge of Reddit's Ask Me Anything. Uh, yeah, so there's there's still a lot a lot of ways to go, but um, it just it really depends on who you ask. Yeah. So as we as we continue to uh, move around the room here, jumping over to Josh with a quick question, Josh, for, from where you sit, what really triggered this in the first place? Can you rewind a little bit for for those who have not heard the background on on how this all came about in terms of boom, this big story, and then the fallout. Well, the timing was kind of weird. I mean, you know, I was on this AMA with Jesse Jackson and Victoria Taylor the day before she was fired. And, um, you know, it was a pretty contentious AMA. You know, there were a lot of trolls and a lot of racist comments. And, you know, some people um, who had posted in white power groups um, that are on Reddit um, had also come to this thread and started posting here. Uh, and, and so, you know, it was a bit rocky. And, um, then I find out, you know, the next day that Taylor was fired and there was a lot of speculation on Reddit that it was related to the Jackson AMA. So, you know, I talked to, to Jackson's folks and I talked to Reddit and they both say there wasn't a relationship there. Um, and I tend, I tend to believe them, but I, it hasn't kind of quelled that rumor. Um, and I think that is because in part, you know, Jackson's focus on diversity issues in Silicon Valley sort of dovetails with, with Powell's um, suit against Kleiner Perkins and her own focus on women in tech. Um, and, you know, she's been cracking down on harassment at Reddit. And so these things all kind of snowball together. But really, um, you know, Taylor didn't, hasn't called me back. So, you know, I don't know what her point of view is, but, you know, I have to take it at face value um, right now that, that the Jackson AMA was, was not a significant factor. Now, uh, Josh, uh, just to follow up on that, now, th this Jesse Jackson AMA, uh, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of racist comments and so on. 
And for anybody who's familiar with AMAs, that's essentially the kind of thing that one can expect. I think that there's a lot of kind of anti-Jesse Jackson uh, sentiment on uh, Reddit that, that could be classified in different ways. So some of it is just racism right. uh, for people who frequent the racist boards, so, one of which was eliminated, most of which have not been eliminated. They're still full up and running. Uh, some of them are, you know, serious but strong uh, disagreement with Jesse Jackson and his career. And, you know, uh, he's been accused of being an opportunist and other things like that. Uh, and, you know, some of it is, you know, positive, constructive and all the rest. So is this is this issue around AMAs another contentious one for the community? In other words, it seems to me that it would make a lot of sense to just not, you know, have a system that doesn't allow racist questions to be asked in the first place. Uh, what is, is there any changes afoot in Reddit to, to, to get the AMAs a little bit, to become more, a little bit more civil? Well, I mean, as you point out, Mike, you know, this was kind of uh, standard practice. Uh, this was not an unusual AMA in that respect. And, you know, that's kind of the culture of Reddit. I mean, you know, it's sort of an anything goes, free speech at all costs uh, environment. And um, I, I don't see that significantly changing without serious pushback from the Reddit community. I mean, even Powell's limited steps to address this by banning like, clearly egregious um, subreddits, you know, led to significant pushback. Uh, and in light of, you know, the current situation with this, this full scale revolt, um, it doesn't strike me as now. It, I don't think now is the time for Reddit to try that. Thank you, Josh. Hey, uh, Polly, jumping on over to you. Um, I, I am starting to hear some chatter about this quote unquote petition drive. Can you describe that to us? What exactly does that involve at this point? Yeah, absolutely. So that actually started a couple of weeks ago before all of this unfolded. Now it's up to over 150,000 signatures. The petition calls basically for Ellen Powell to be removed. Removed no matter what, no questions asked, we have to get rid of her. Obviously it was started because of some of the issues that Josh mentioned over time. People were interested in that to begin with before. Now it's really moved into just an issue of Ellen being related to this moderator problem. They basically see a lot of the executives at Reddit as kind of against the moderators, which just isn't productive for Reddit and it's not productive for the moderators, but that's really what it's like right now. It's sort of you versus me. They're really having a hard time working together. And I think the executives are more at fault there. They really have put up kind of a big glass wall and they have to rely on the moderators for providing free labor to actually keep their website running. Now, Polly, I think it's uh, it, as far as I can tell, she's leaving. She's going to she's going to be uh, uh, shuffled out of that company. And the reason is that she's only the interim CEO. She was there uh, temporarily from the beginning, uh, just until they find a permanent CEO in order for her to become to stick around. That would involve the uh, Reddit uh, uh, founders and board, et cetera, to actually hire her as the permanent CEO, I don't see that happening. That would be just a disaster, I think, if they did that. So she's leaving, as far as I'm concerned. And it's I just think right now it would be a long shot. Yeah, I would yeah. totally agree with you right now. Certainly a long shot. I think probably she might try to discuss things. She might try to at least smooth it over. So when she leaves, it's comfortable. It's not as really tense as it is right now. Well, I think, hey, uh, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, I got to follow up in terms of the financial model here. Now, as we've covered, um, a lot of this moderation is free labor. And yet Reddit, at, at best, I think, is break even, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but may in fact actually be losing money. You know, Sarah, from your vantage point, what does this say about their business model and or whether or not they can scale this thing as the moderators are all up in arms? Any clues there as to what may be going on with the model? Uh, yeah, so... This is a little bit tricky, right? So Ellen was brought in specifically. So Yishan Wong was brought in. He, uh, the the former CEO, uh, was brought in to, for growth and to. There was a lot of discussion about profit back then. Then Ellen uh, took over when Yishan uh, stepped down. However, you want to look at that uh, because they were trying to relocate Reddit employees. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on. Reddit to make a profit, especially after making pulling in fifty million dollars, there's a lot of pressure. The problem is, uh, they were given that money. From my understanding, they were given that money because of the growth and because they have what 170 million uh, visitors, uh, unique 
every month and uh, but they're they, but they haven't been profitable yet so there's a lot of pressure to make them profitable but in order to do that uh, red has been trying to clean up its act and that's been changing everything and that's been make a lot of people mad so I I don't know uh, that's very problematic for for the model that they were built on to turn into something that is going to be profitable for the company and I'm not really sure how they do that without losing an audience or changing Thing. We're having some uh, audio uh, problems there. I think it might be related to your microphone, Sarah. Now, quick question for you, Sarah. One final quick question. What's the one thing that you uh, think that uh, should uh, be done at Reddit that would uh, fix kind of this larger issue of moderator unhappiness, lack of uh, revenue, et cetera? What, what would you advise Reddit to do at this point? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, and if you get it right, you win the prize of becoming the new CEO. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I get it right. I get to be the CEO. Uh, so <laughs> that's a tough question because it was built on this sort of free speech. Anything goes. You can you can do what you want. Uh, and it had massive growth based on that. Right. But they never pulled in a profit on that. So now there's immense pressure to pull in a profit based on this community that's just huge, but was built for something completely different. How you, how you switch that up. I, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, well, they're going to have to change a lot of things and somehow figure out a way to continue the growth that they've had. Josh, same question. How would you fix Reddit? Well, you know, I think obviously it, it, the first step is building better relationships with the, the mods. And uh, once you have that trust in place and they feel like they're, they're part of the, the process of, of evolving Reddit, then uh, potentially you could start to change things. Um, you know, we, I, I, I could see a play if they could get to that place of, of mutual trust, then maybe they could start to make incremental steps whereby empowering the mods more to crack down on you know egregious speech in a way that's sort of commensurate with the culture of Reddit, um, they can slowly begin to improve things. All right, good answer. And uh, Polly, we'll uh, we'll let you uh, finish up by telling us how you would fix Reddit or what advice you'd give Reddit. Oh man, well for starters, I would like to host her own AMA. I think people are really <laughs> hoping for that right now. I think beyond that, there also needs to be kind of a liaison. And Victoria was taking on that role of someone between the moderators and the company. But I think there needs to be another position created, someone that basically just helps smooth this over, not just the AMA person, but an entirely different job or really maybe an entirely different department, someone that can really build the trust, maybe even hire moderators to do it, kind of bridge that gap. It would certainly cost money, but it might save them from revolt. Yes, and they are revolting sometimes. Uh, Sarah Burr uh, is at TechCrunch.com, and you can follow her on Twitter at Sarah Burr. Her Burr is spelled B-U-H-R. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah, at long, long last. Thanks. All right, take care. And Josh Harkinson is at MotherJones.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Josh Harkinson. Before I let you go, Josh, let me ask you a quick question. You write at uh, Mother Jones, which uh, it's a publication that I absolutely love. You do some great journalism over there, all of you people. <laughs> and I'm just curious, what else, what are the sorts of things you write about at, uh, at Mother Jones? Well, you know, I mean, I cover the tech beat, obviously. And, you know, I, I did a story about Jesse Jackson's diversity efforts. But beyond that, you know, I cover drug policy. So I go up to the Emerald Triangle and, you know, uh, talk to pot farmers sometimes. Any um, hands-on reviews there? You know, we're not to the point of doing reviews yet, um, but I have been given free weed, um, not not by request, just, you know, it tends to happen sometimes. <laughs> it hap Hey, you know, we're all in, in the media here. It happens. All right, Josh. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. And Polly Mossans is at Newsweek.com. You can follow her on Twitter at Polly. Uh, Polly, I want to thank you so much for coming on again. This is your first time as a Newsweek uh, journalist. And uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, take care. We got some more news for you coming right up. But first, let's talk about Gazelle. And let's talk about a loophole that Gazelle offers you for getting a better phone than you would otherwise get. All of us, of course, would love to spend an infinite amount of money on our next phone or tablet or whatever. But of course, we all have budgets. We can't just spend infinite amounts. We have to basically say, okay, we can only spend $300 or $400 or $500. You start with the budget and you think, how much phone can I get for my money? 
And the, the loophole is if you buy from Gazelle, you will buy a much better phone than if you buy a brand new phone. And of course, there's no such thing as using a brand new phone. As soon as you use it, it's been used. And so you might as well get one at a significant discount from Gazelle uh, that, that's just like a brand new phone, that's just one of the hot phones that's currently available, and their prices are phenomenal. Yeah, you can save money if you want, or you can take that same money and get a much better phone. You can upgrade before you even buy the device. Gazelle is the greatest place to buy a phone, a tablet, and you know what? A lot of people don't realize this, but Gazelle also sells accessories like cables, chargers, screen protectors, and more. So if you need accessories and you want to buy them at a very low price, go to Gazelle and check out the accessories as well. you got to go to G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com and check out Gazelle next time you're going to buy the new hotness. Find out what your iPhone's worth. Take a minute and go to Gazelle.com to find out. Well, a U.S. company called Megabots has challenged the Japanese robot maker Suidobashi to a robot fight. Mike Murphy is a reporter for Quartz and joins us now to talk about it. Welcome to you, Mike. Hey there. How are you doing? Hey. <laughs> this, is, this is sounding like it's going to be an epic robot battle of enormous proportions. Can you tell us about the Japanese contender called uh, Kuratas? Sure. So, um... Karatis was was made a few years ago. I think it was 20, 2012, um, after uh, the the founder uh, Kagoro Karata, um, who had been influenced by uh, you know the the mecha and robot uh, kind of characters that have been in Jan uh, Japanese anime for decades, when he kind of realized, well, there, there's not really any robots like this in the world, so I think I'm going to build one. And um, they've they worked on that for a couple of years, and it, I think it was debuted in 2012. Um, and now there's an American team uh, called Megabots who've decided um, they want to challenge the, uh, Karata to a to a robot fight. One of my favorite uh, features of the Karata is that, uh, as I understand it, uh, the robot will uh, actually fire rapid fire BBs when the pilot smiles. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Uh, that's pretty crazy. I know it's it's controlled by a, a, a Kinect uh, system like your Xbox would be, um, and they, they've called it uh, next generation uh, technology. So I don't know. Hopefully the next generation of technology that we use doesn't fire our BBs when we smile at our cell phones. <laughs> Hey, Mike, is there a line in Vegas for this yet? Uh, you know, give me some background here. Is, is Karatis like a really killer robot that's undefeated with, with TKOs everywhere? And, and how might the American robot fare against this thing? Well, uh, actually, that's the thing. This is going to be the first uh, robot fight of its kind. Uh, the American team, Megabots, are trying to use this uh, duel as a way to start like a robot fighting league. Um, I, I think it'd be a pretty <laughs> fair fight, to be honest. Um, the, uh, Karata said of the American robot, uh, after he accepted the challenge that it was very American, put lots of guns on it and it's quite big and, and garish and that sort of thing. But, um, the, I've, sp I've spoken to the Megabots guys and their main concern right now is figuring out how to make their robot, uh, uh, safe enough so that they don't die, which, uh, you know, it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big thing to, to figure out. That's a good starting point for sure. Uh, now, um, one of the things that uh, that Karada said was that uh, Japan has to win because robots robots are such a big part of Japanese culture. But isn't excessive violence for the purpose of entertainment part of American culture? Whose culture wins here? <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that uh, you know Jap the the Japanese might have the robots, but we definitely have the guns over here in the U.S. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty close fight. Um, the the Japanese robot, the Karatas, has a, a Gatling gun for for one of its arms, but uh, Megabots has two cannons. Um, one that shoots currently shoots paintballs that I think are about four pounds in size. <laughs> but um, Karatas wants to have the fight uh, conducted not over paintballs, but over either live ammo or he actually said uh, that they <laughs> he wants to beat the American team into into scrap. So um, <laughs> it's going to be pretty intense. So, Mike, one follow-up. But might we actually see a, a, a league organized based on this battle, or is that just wishful thinking? Well, um, I asked Megabots uh, that, and they said, yes, that's their hope. Um, I don't know where exactly we could hold this sort of thing. Um, we have a hard enough time keeping TV shows like BattleBots on the air over here. 
So um, I also don't know what kind of size arena you, you would need these giant. These, these things are like 15 feet tall. So it's not exactly like something you could have at like a, you know, a local football field or something. Uh, you're going to need a lot of space for this. You know, and all those like old anime movies where the, there's giant robots, like things fighting Godzilla and things like that. They always take out like half of a city while they're doing it. So uh, this is going to be a pretty big endeavor, I think. We just uh, find an unpopular city to hold it in. Uh, problem solved. <laughs> Mike, Mike Murphy is at QZ.com. You can follow him on Twitter at MCWM. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. No problem. All right, take care. Well, The Verge co-founder and editor-in-chief Neele Patel wrote yesterday that The Verge will be turning off all comments on the site for a few weeks. Here's part of what he wrote, and I quote, What we found lately is that the tone of our comments and some of our commenters is getting a little too aggressive and negative, a change that feels like it started with Gamergate and has gotten steadily worse ever since. It's hard for us to do our best work in that environment, and it's even harder for our staff to hang out with our audience and build the relationships that led us to having great community in the first place. That's a bad feedback loop, and we want it to stop. So we're going to call a timeout for a while and turn comments off by default on all posts for the next few weeks. And he intimated that when they do come back, uh, they are going to be selective about which co posts have comments and so on. Joe Panettiere, this is a tragedy, but as far as I'm concerned, this is what happens on the new internet if you allow anonymous uh, comments on posts. You're going to get trolls, haters, uh, racists, all the rest, the whole cast of characters. It's a blood sport nowadays. In the days when people could go online and find a bunch of uh, like-minded geeks of goodwill uh, trying to have a, a constructive conversation are gone for good because the trolls take over and wreck conversations. That's what makes them trolls. Uh, but uh, this is a tragedy, I think. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think uh, they ought to do at the Verge to uh, to bring back comments and make those uh, comments constructive? Yeah, you know, tricky times between this and and what we were talking about earlier with Reddit, and and it all goes back to sort of moderation and the management of content and who's going to do that. And uh, the simple answer here with the Verge seems to be, well, how come you're not just going to gate it and make this a login for the commenter to, and and they would have to show a corporate email address rather than some. Uh, you know, attempt to use a public cloud service email address where they can keep changing identities over and over again. So, you know, frankly, I, I don't understand sort of this stopgap solution where you just turn off everything for a bit. Uh, I, I would just uh, implement some sort of gating service. I mean, all the technology is there to do that almost instantly. It is. What happens, though, is that uh, is that you end up with a significantly lower quantity of comments. You also get some uh, uh, some. Uh, you know, bad, sort of bad will from your uh, readership and so on. So it, it, it is tricky, and I agree with you. I mean, popular it was a popular science or one of the big uh, science publications permanently ended all comments yeah. on your site, which is tragic because the whole point of that publication was to start conversations about science and get people excited about science. So it's really tragic, and I think that ultimately the solution has got to be something uh, that you suggested, which is, you know, it's anonymity is the problem. And if you can very easily and quickly and sort of have friction-free access to posting anonymous comments, you, the, you know, the trolls, by the way, the other dynamic that's happening, it's not just a place like The Verge, trolls are being shut out all over the internet because, mm. you know, there, you know, fewer and fewer sites are tolerating trolls. So the trolls are kind of a constant. There's like a, some, some, some number out there of trolls. And as they have fewer and fewer places to do their trolling, they go to the places where they can still do it. So if you still are open for business for trolls, it's going to get worse and worse and worse as they find the new home with you. And so I think they've got to find a way to de-anonymize to a certain extent. Could be something as simple as having a, you know, requiring a Facebook account or it could be, you know, it could be some, you know, something associated with this. I think this is a business opportunity. There's got to be a way for people to, um, to have, expedited access. For example, you could have people who use, you know, some sort of biometric access through, through their smartphone uh, to authenticate themselves as a known trusted, you know, user. And then if you're not right. authenticated so like that, then you get moderated, you get queued up for, for a human moderator to go through and decide whether you're trolling. Right. And you can almost do that through so something similar to an ad network approach where, uh, you know, the ad networks display uh, approved ads across certain websites uh, based on what, what's going on on those websites. So you can almost do the same thing. It's almost like a... Uh, 
uh, easy access or speed access uh, through the airport system, right? So you're trusted at one airport, you're trusted through all of them. So maybe you're right. There's a way here to get into some sort of approved queue and that queue gives you granted access into all these different websites. We'll see. Um, the problem certainly isn't going away though. It just seems to be uh, coming up over and over again as we do each show uh, week to week. Yeah. And again, uh, you know, I, I love this. One of the things I love about Google Plus is that I can start conversations on Google Plus. And then inevitably when the trolls come out, I, I delete their comment. It's super easy. I block them. That's super easy. And I never hear from them again. There's a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of uh, anonymous trolling where occasionally somebody will create new, you know, now that they don't have a real names policy, uh, create a new account and come back and troll some more. But I just block that one as well. It's so easy. It's got to be much, much easier to block than it is to troll. And once you get yeah. that dynamic, it just becomes at some point uh, not worth it uh, for the haters. And so good luck to The Verge. It's something that all publications are dealing with. Uh, you know, haters going to hate, you know. What are you going to do? Well, Apple is implementing, uh, speaking of companies that people hate, Apple is implementing a unique policy for third-party accessories sold in its retail Apple stores, according to a piece on 9to5Mac. All, get this, all accessories for sale in Apple stores will be required to have packaging co-designed by Apple. The packaging will be mostly white and have consistent labeling. Joe, have they gone too far? This sounds kind of insane. Absolutely. You know, when I, when I heard about this, Mike, the first thing I thought of was, was that very Apple ad, the 1984 ad for the Super Bowl back in 1984, yeah. where they were, they were breaking us free. Yeah, from the firm grip of IBM and total control and and being drones. Well, guess what? They're going to whitewash everything in their stores. Third party brands are going to be de-emphasized in order to get shelf space in an Apple store. That that's a little scary. It's amazing. I mean, I, I think that if I am, am trying to reverse engineer Apple's thinking here, Johnny I walked into an Apple store one day and said, "You know why? Why is this so ugly?" You know, it's because of those other <laughs> products that I didn't design. <laughs> right, right. Wrecking the whole but, place. You know, you know, the other thing here is Apple has to be very careful. What what if they go about and, and they do this whitewash design on the third parties, and then one of those third parties has a lawsuit or has some sort of issue with their device? Um, now, it's not an Apple device or an Apple product per se, but suddenly Apple's brand is really sticky and, and attached to, to that brand that just went down the tubes. Why would you want to do that? Yeah, exactly. It's all very weird. And of course, the uh, the subtext of all this is that the number of products that they're going to be offering is going to be uh, reduced significantly. So they're going to have a, a, a fewer number of, of partners roll out with the new designs at some point, And then later they may or may not decide to bring back others as soon as they redesign their packaging uh, in cahoots with Apple. And of course, if you design something in partnership with, with Apple, that means Apple calls the shots and determines exactly what that that design is and has to approve anything that the company that owns the product and, and sells the product wants to do. Well, in product update news, Twitter announced yesterday that you can add your birthday to your Twitter profile. The feature has separate sharing options for the date and for the year. So for example, you can make your birthday public, you know, January 2nd, uh, but the year you were born private. So you don't have to reveal your age uh, if you don't want to. The information, of course, can be used by Twitter to serve up more relevant advertising because they'll know your age. And to add your birthday, just go to your profile and choose Edit Profile. This is, uh, Joe, part of the long, long-standing Facebookification of Twitter. Yeah, and, and con contextual advertising. You know, I, I've got multiple Twitter accounts, both personally and then my, my corporate accounts. And I'm, I'm sort of curious here if I, if I set the defaults for my birthday to be sort of, uh, in, in one case, I'm a millennial, which I'm certainly not. Yeah. Uh, in another case, I'm Gen X, which I am. And then another case, I'm a boomer. I, I would just be curious to see what type of ads come up in the dynamics and, and, and how different my experience would be based on those three settings. Right. One of them, they're going to be se trying to sell you a, a GoPro camera and the other one, they're going to be selling you Geritol. So uh, we'll see. We'll see if they get it right with the uh, with the uh, Gen X uh, accounts. Yeah, I should try the same thing. I've got multiple accounts as well. Well, in big number news, we've got a huge number here for you. Three hundred and fifty one thousand nine hundred and forty. That's how many government requests for data T-Mobile got in 2014. For some reason, T-Mobile got more requests than any other U.S. wireless carrier. Most of these requests came in the form of criminal or civil subpoenas. More than 17,000 were for warrants. 
and more than 3,000 were for wiretap orders, and the lion's share of those were sort of national security, NSA type of uh, requests. We learned this information in the company's first ever transparency report published yesterday. Joe Panettiere, any guess as to why T-Mobile's getting more than other carriers? You know, I have no idea. The thing that really interests me is if T-Mobile could put a dollar amount on that. You know, you, you always see these research reports, for instance, on like, oh, you know, I had to call the help desk today and it cost X amount of dollars to, to reset my password. Every time the government calls and has this request, I wonder how much it, it, it actually costs T-Mobile to get the right people involved, get the right data pooled, and, and, and then respond to that inquiry. I mean, my God. The, the, the hurdles that these companies are jumping through for government inquiries has just got to be unbelievable at this point. And obviously, they're not paying them for it. That's just something that they have to do because, you know, the government's pointing a gun at them, basically. Oh, well, what are you going to do? Well, our TNT fan of the day is Rickard Olsen in Skåne, Sweden. He posted this picture on Twitter while having some cold Lagunitas brewed and bottled right here in Petaluma, California. He says it's almost like being there, there being, of course, the Brick House, which is literally, a, you can stagger from, from Lagunitas to the Brick House here. It's that close. Very nice. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup or your beer and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Joe Panettiere, thank you so much for co-anchoring. As always, great stuff. I love to see it. And we will see you next Tuesday. Mike, thank you very much. And by the way, Mike, I don't know if it was this week or last week, but it was somewhere around here where I, I started joining you about a year ago. So thank you very much for one year. Oh, it's wow. been great so far. I'm really enjoying it. A year passes like nothing. If you know that reference, <laughs> you're as old as I am. <laughs> Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. Anyway, Joe Penitary, thank you so much, and we'll see you again. Take care, Mike. Right, Bye-bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today. The best place to go is twit.tv slash TNT. And you can watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv. Just click on the live button. You can follow us on Facebook. Our Facebook name is facebook.com slash TV, And you can follow me on all the social networks at elgin.com. Don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. This show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.